and gentlemen, glad to see some women in the audience. I have been in this industry for a long time, as Ray just mentioned, and certainly, especially in the early years, it was a bunch of men, so I'm glad to see a lot of women in the audience. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted to give a little bit more detail on my background so that you understand what uh, really makes me the expert up here to talk about channel strategies. I started my career early on with brands like Sundance Juice Sparklers and Tropicana Juices. I then went to the other side of the business, which was the retailer, and I spent several years with 7-Eleven eventually managing all of the beverage business for North America, including the beverage business for 5,500 stores in our proprietary Slurpee Big Gulp business. That was a $3.3 million business. But I decided to follow my passion, and my passion was to really work for a startup company. So I went to work for FRS Healthy Energy, and I became their general manager of retail sales. My team in the first year closed all our white spaces, which is a term about DSD, when you are able to penetrate an entire region in every county with a DSD distributor. And it's really important to do that as you launch, if, we, if we're talking about DSD, as well as selling into retailers like GNC was one of our first early adopters, Target. We actually started out in the first year with a test with Target. We sold into many, many regional grocery chains in the West Coast market. And we also sold into our first mainstream grocery chain, Albertsons, in that first year. So really in, engaged me back into all channels of trade and certainly um, selling a, a brand that was a startup brand. And I continued to work for other startups, most recently the CEO of a energy shock company called Bozzi, a nutritional energy shock company. And then I really, really went after my passion, which was to uh, form my own company called Growing Innovative Brands and um, become a consultant to help emerging brands get their products to market. And it's why that um, today it made such a good marriage for a meta brand and, and us and me to come together is because we have the same passion together as a team. And I'll share with you a little bit later about, you know, how that passion has so much breadth to it as well, because we really, really want to be able to help avoid the mistakes that are so easy to make in this industry and to help you do that. So why is this industry so tough? You heard it from you heard it from almost everybody who stood up here that this industry is really, really tough. Well, this is what the reality is today, is that there's product category overload. When I was selling the first New Age brand, which was Sundance Juice Sparklers, the only thing in the aisle of beverages outside of juices was carbonated soft drinks, New York seltzer, and Perrier in a green bottle. We weren't even dealing with this new phenomena, phenomena of bottled water that has become such a big category. We were really selling an, an incrementally new opportunity to the retailer, and nobody else was doing it yet. And so that's, that's really what product category overload is about, because today, it's unbelievable how many beverages exist by category. Uh, and we're going to talk about it a little bit later. Product differentiation, you, you heard a lot of other people talk about that today as well. It's really, it's absolutely imperative. It's, it's a new term that we call disruption. You have got to be able to disrupt in order to be successful. And that's because the consumer ignores clutter. They have so much. They have clutter in 
brands. They have clutter in messaging. They have clutter in technology. They have clutter everywhere. And they can only process a certain amount of information. So what the marketing experts tell us today is that they just block it all out. So you're really going to have to communicate with them and communicate with them at the point of purchase, which is on the package. Retailers evaluate product mix one to two times a year. And a lot of retailers today still do not review their product mix any more than a, a one time. A spring summer set and maybe they do a refresh in the fall winter. So we've got lots and lots of challenges in order to sell our product into the retailer who is ultimately going to get it to our consumer. We talk about the 10 pillars. The 10 pillars are really the absolute 10 things that you must execute impeccably to be successful. And I'm, you've heard a lot about these 10 pillars today. You've heard um, what you need to be successful. I want to focus on the viable business model, which is pillar number four. None of these are in any particular order because they're all necessary, but I'll, I'll take you through how that relates to really selling your product and what price point that you're going to sell it to and how you're going to make money as a company. And then really focus on channel strategies and distribution models. So this is the viable business model, and it is just a simple spreadsheet. But what is really important, you've got an idea, and hopefully before you have that idea, you've thought about what is already out there in the marketplace, and you've thought about, you know, what, what's my consumer need, and, and how am I going to package this, and what category is it going to play in? So you go look at the competition, or what you assume is your competition. And in the example of a tea, you might go to the tea category, especially in a whole foods market, and you know that you're interested in, in coming out with a functional high-end tea. And so you look across the category and you understand that these teas range in price from somewhere around $1.89 to $2.29, $2.49. So you establish where you can get, what, what price point that you can command with the consumer. And that's really your starting point. Now go back up to the beginning, and, and Bill talked about cost of goods and involving and including shipping and fulfillment. Uh, those are all part of the cost of goods. So I want you to take this retail strat strategy, this retail pricing strategy, and go all the way back to the beginning of your business model and plug in your cost of goods. Now, you have the revenue, which is the price that you actually charge to the distributor, and Bill also just talked about this in his slides, minus the cost of goods, gets you the gross margin. And this is the most important margin in the model. All of the ind industry experts will tell you, and, and probably Brad, I think, is going to talk about this later on, is that the minimum that you need to have is 35%, and I would like to see 40%, because after, after this line, comes sales, marketing, and G&A expenses. And so in order to understand whether or not you have the ability to introduce a product to market, you got to know whether or not you're going to make enough money as a company. And then you want to include all the structures of the supply chain throughout this model. So whether or not you're going direct or DSD, the margin for delivery is different. And DSD is a higher margin, and, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that later. But you plug in your margin, and then you've got your unit cost to the retailer, so it's what the delivery system charge, charges the retailer. You've got your retail price, and then you make sure that you've got the appropriate margins for the retailer. And they all are different depending on the channel, but what you're doing here is you're, you're taking an average and you're trying to understand whether or not you've got 
a product that will be able to be marketed to the consumer. The retailer is going to take about 38 to 48 percent in margins depending on who they are. Now, that also, if you haven't, and I recommend this before you go do anything else, if you have not actually gone into formulation work, then what you've got here is actually a cost of goods budget because you probably didn't know how to fill in these numbers um, when, you, when you started if you haven't done any formulation work yet. Now you've got your budget to work within and you know that the whole model works from beginning to end. Obviously later on you'll, you'll build the formalized business model that gets all your other expenses in there and everything. But this is really a way of determining that you've got an idea and that you can get it to market and make money. Eventually, by the way, not <laughs> at first. These are the retailers that sell beverages. And there's two categories of retailers. There's what I call take home. And the second category is immediate consumption. They sort of speak for themselves, but they're about the shopping experience. And when you're thinking about your strategies, you want to think about how is the consumer shopping? What's their trip mission? And, and I'll have a slide on that in a little bit more detail in a few minutes here. But take home in general is an experience where the consumer goes in and takes packages home to put in their pantry. They're stocking up. And one of the reasons why we as beverage entrepreneurs want to eventually move into and very strategically move into multi-packs because the take-home packages and the take-home business is higher volumes per outlet. And it's not because you're necessarily having people drink more from those particular outlets, but it's because they're buying in multiple packages and they're taking them home and they're, and they're putting them into their pantries. These are supermarkets, these are traditional specialty grocery, natural grocery of course, they are club stores, mass, and drug, um, but there's some changes that are happening in drug. Immediate consumption is exactly what it means. And traditionally, it's going to be lower volumes per outlet, uh, but it can depend on the category. As an example, energy drinks have, they do 80% of all their volume out of this immediate consumption area because they sell a tremendous amount um, in bars and restaurants, but also convenience stores is, is the heart of their business. But for the most part, it's a lower volume um, per outlet opportunity, and it's very much a marketing opportunity because it's um, a great way to get trial, and it's a great way to get the, the um, product in front of the consumer immediately. They're going to drink it right away. So in a, there's some new information that I pulled off the internet uh, a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's really about drug that's changed, but to talk a little bit more about this trip mission, because it, it will influence where you position your product in these particular outlets. It will influence what kind of packages you have within these particular outlets, and it will definitely influence your sales and profits. Um, as you can see, grocery, which is the first one, high percentage of stock up and fill in. Dollar stores, um, all kinds of trip mission experiences. Club, 50% stock up, and as we all know, club is pretty big with regard to um, um, big sizes. And mass, 42%. Drug um, also going across several categories. And what this says is, and what we've been saying for years, is this thing called channel blurring. Well, now I can buy a beverage. I can buy a bottle of aspirin in multiple channels, and I will do it. I will do it as a consumer. So um, we need to be cognizant of that as well. Um, and there's also this dynamic of browse and buy versus search and retrieve. So shoppers visiting drug exhibited both, as an example. And um, we, 
we kind of knew that because it's, it's more of a female shopper and they're shopping for a lot of things shopping, but um, uh, more and more drug is seen as highly convenient and that's where it becomes a bigger opportunity for beverages. Bever uh, drug has been trying for years to be a mini convenience store to female and they have not um, necessarily been successful, but yet recently there is new documentation that says the consumer is actually shopping this as well for convenience, and that makes the immediate consumption opportunity in drug a much bigger opportunity than it was. Um, but the only thing that I found interesting about this is that they, because they're shopping so quickly, they have little interest in discovering new items. So, um, it, some dynamics about drug. Also, to further talk about strategies, and there was a slide that Bill showed about the different margins across the retailer channels. It, it's also driven by their strategy, strategies around pricing. And this is some of the things that you'll work through as you work through your pricing strategies specific to channels. But um, convenience is traditionally higher retail. The grocery business um, manages their pricing in, in two different ways. They either make the, the choice to be everyday low price or a high low, which is to have a regular retail most of the time and then promote to the consumer every so often. And so that's the high low strategy. Natural and specialty is pretty much a quality premium pricing environment. Mass is value. Club um, actually shares the value with you, and although they're going to ask you to do a special package and they're going to ask you to sell it to them very um, inexpensively, they also uh, sell products on a lower margin, 11 to 13 percent, I think was on Bill's slide. And, and then drug, of course. All of them, pretty much, as a matter of fact, everybody, 80% of all purchase decisions, regardless of the category, are pretty much female. And so another point to be made, don't make the mistake of developing your product, getting it to market, putting the messaging on there, and not asking a female consumer about what they think about it. And I, believe me, I did the, the brand that I most recently ran, um, when I first asked the marketing guys how many women did they ask about this packaging, they said, no, why would we do that? <laughs> so anyway, um, I wanted to use specifically convenience as a case study to talk about what the real volume opportunity is and to, to think about how the sales really come out of a, a particular category or how the sales um, can be affected by a particular channel. So the convenience store industry is worth 149,000, 150,000 stores nationally. It's a huge, huge industry. It's almost $200 billion. But 80% of all their sales come out of five categories. That cigarettes is number one food service, packaged beverages, which packaged beverages, by the way, is only 14%, beer, 7%, and other tobacco products, 4%. They do, on average, about a million dollars a store a year in merchandise sales, and they have about 1,000 customers a day. Their average register ring is 5 to $6, so many of them, by the way, buy a pack of cigarettes. Well, today they may only be buying a pack of cigarettes, but a pack of cigarettes and a beverage. But, the, but unlike drug that I just pointed out with this new dynamic of getting in quick and out, uh, quick and fast, the New York Association of Convenience Stores says that the convenience store industry is a great opportunity for innovation. And um, I'll, I'll tell you why that can be true, but also a challenge in just a second. One of the reasons why it can be true is because convenience stores are clearly a destination for beverages. And they're really, outside of um, a restaurant or a bar, they're, they're really one of the only places that um, can, can say that they're a, a true destination for beverages. And that's because 
first of all, all the beverages combined, all the, all the Slurpees, the beer, the milk, the packaged beverages, all of them combined are about a third of all convenience store sales. So almost 40% of all convenience store sales are all beverages. They know what they want. A destination really means they know what they want before they ever walk in the door. So they know before they walk in the front door that they're thirsty and that they, they will make their decision in 30 seconds. So back to my point earlier about making sure that your messaging causes disruption right there on the bottle uh, is going to be very, very important. Um, it's, 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 uh, destination is about after controlling location, prices, and features, it increases the probability of a person who chooses a store. And that's one of the reasons why 7-Eleven was, was by far the premier in offering se selection in beverages to the, the convenience store customer. So the real potential, 1,000 customers a day, 300 buy a beverage, 140 buy a packaged beverage, there's three to 500 SKUs in the door. So the top two to five items in any category represents about 80% of all the business. The bottom bunch, less than 20%. So overall, you're gonna sell somewhere between a half a bottle to a bottle a day. And I used to have entrepreneurs come in and see me all the time and I'd say, well, I'm, you know, you're gonna have to sell a bottle a day to stay on the shelf, and they say, ha, well, that's easy. No, it's not. I hope that this made sense. Where does your beverage land? And that's the amount of space, by the way, that all these beverages fit in, three to 500 items. I also wanted to take you through a little category review to, to get an idea of Everybody that's been up here has talked about this, this market opportunity. You know, um, what's the overall opportunity? And certainly, the bigger the category that you're going into, the bigger the opportunity. And I'll show you why through this little case study here, but um, this is just a breakdown that the syndicated data sources actually provide to us. And syndicated data, by the way, which is one of the things when you go into retailers, if any of you in the room, how many, just by a show of hands, have already presented to a retailer? So there's a few of you. Did any of those retailers ask you or tell you that you had to be in syndicated data first in order to, no? Well, it will happen. And the, what they're saying to you is that they're not innovators, first of all, and that you should already be tracking on syndicated data resources in order for them to even look at your product. And what they're telling you is basically no. They're ba basically telling you, by the way, to come back, uh, because even with the retailer, it's, it's never no, but, but to come back because I don't want to look at you until after you've you've measured on syndicated data. And this is all food, drug, C-store, and mass, excluding Walmart. And you can ask me on the break why it excludes Walmart if you're interested. But the top category is beer, and the second biggest category is bottled water. The smallest category, but the one that, quite frankly, experienced a lot of growth over the last five to 10 years is, is coffee and tea combined. As far as water is concerned, it's an $11 billion category. And as you can see, there's a lot of items in there doing a lot of sales. And um, as category managers and category leaders, many categories, uh, we will make a decision that we want to have va three tiers, value, mid-tier, and premium. And those are pricing strategies. And as you, as entrepreneurs, you'll also want to consider this when you're going to market because you're most likely going to have a premium strategy. You've got differentiation. You've got an upscale product. It's most likely going to be your strategy. And you're, wanna, you're gonna wanna stick to that strategy because your pricing strategy is what communicates to your consumer the value 
of the brand. And in this business, private label or store brands are value brands, as well as Nestle Pure Life would be a example of a, a value brand. And they're just trying to sell volume, sell volume. And every category needs that kind of brand. And the mid-tiers, which in this particular example are Aquafina, Dasani, and the regional Nestle water brands, Arrowhead out here, Poland Springs, they're all mid-tier. And they're, they're a good price point. Um, they, they do generate volume. They're probably promoted quite often. A good, solid base for the category. And then premium, which is Fiji, Smart Water, Evian, um, and, and certainly... Um, a, a lot of premium waters are coming out these days. That gives the retailer the opportunity to sell something at a higher price point to make more penny profit for them and to, um, to kind of marginalize or, or average out the entire category. And um, it's, it's really important. But when I'm a retailer, if I've got something like a premium segment that this, in this example, premium segment represents about the total, 10% uh, of the total business here, the total revenue, then I'm probably only going to have one to two SKUs, um, or one to two brands. If I'm a grocery, I'm going to have more SKUs, but if I'm a C store, as an example, I'm probably going to have one to two SKUs. Now let's look at the opposite extreme. So. Here's, I, I've got a $2 billion category, and it's, it's protein and um, weight control, which a lot of innovation coming out here. Um, but based on a $2 billion category, if I'm a convenience store, as an example, I don't have any room for anybody else except for the number one selling brand. And I'm going to be hard-pressed to add any innovation to this category because I just don't generate enough revenues. Um, if I move to the drug channel or if I move even to the grocery channel, this category becomes bigger for me because it's such a functional category, and I make different decisions based on that. So selling to the channel your product. Um, one of the things that I just wanted to point out is that you're going to need to make sure that um, you're on trend, you're at the growth of your life cycle, you want to know who your consumer is and make sure you know it. Um, do you, are you really satisfying a need state and are you um, in a category that has size and growth? I am beginning to run out of time here so I'm not going to talk much about distribution systems other than to, to emphasize that it's not all about just DSD or direct. It's about what's right for the channel, what's right for the retailer, what's right for the category, and what's right for the brand. And those are, those are all different um, decision-making points in order to help you understand what's the best model for you, because today it's all about the best model. And then there's hybrid. Your brand, your consumer, align with the right channels, align with the right distribution system, that gives you the strategy to begin your proof of concept, move into your regional launch, and then be successful when you're ready to do that national sweep. This is a list of the important attributes that it will want to be a part of your sales presentation. As Bill said, you don't want a lot of slides. I like to say you need to make sure that you've got the answers to every single one of these questions and you'll be getting the presentation um, uh, later on so you can review this and present it in a succinct, succinct concise manner. Don't be caught off guard. Thank you. Uh, five or six minutes worth of questions. Does anyone have any questions for Debbie? Yes, one second. Um, 
so I was wondering if uh, on the business model slide, if you don't know what your cost of goods are because you haven't gone to a formulator, a formulator or whatever, um, how would you approximate those numbers? Do you just do it by the prices of how you, I don't know, how you've been formulating it at home or I'm just not sure? Yeah, what I do on those business models, first of all, I have an idea on average what it takes to um, build a, a bottle of a beverage. You know, I know what the bottle costs are. I know what the ingredients are. That being said, you just start plugging in numbers, okay? Because the, the key at the beginning, where I would start is with the retail price and then the revenue. And then that will give you, that will ensure that you've got the right gross um, margin and you can kind of go, just go back in and just adjust, just keep on adjusting your, your numbers. But, you know, certainly any of us could give you just a rough estimate of what, you know, it takes to, um, um, to build a beverage. And, that, and that's a pretty solid, that's a pretty solid chart up there. The biggest stumbling blocks that you see when new brands go into retail channels, and it's not necessarily the right retail channel for them at, at the very beginning, how do, you, how do you avoid those stumbling blocks from the very start? If it's not the right... So when, they're getting, when they get into their first retail channel, it turns out that's not the, necessarily the right channel for that product. How do you avoid those kind of mistakes going, uh, starting from, the, starting from the, uh, when you first launch? Well, it's all about understanding the consumer. And so you understand who your consumer is. Then you work into where that consumer shops and um, the region of the country, the, the geography. All those things are important factors in really building your strategy on what retailer to go into. And, um, and, and so if you don't do that up front, which a lot of us, quite honestly, just assume that the best channel for us is this channel or that channel, you know, convenience, a lot of entrepreneurs like to go into convenience. It's really not necessarily your best channel in a lot of instances today to, to launch in first. So, you know, taking in all the factors of who's shopping at that channel, where they live, Where's the concentration of where they live? And um, certainly, you know, how they shop, do they definitely have a need for your product? And then going into the right retail channel from that perspective. Great. Okay, I think we're gonna break for lunch. Thanks so much, Debbie, that was really great.